Hello. Uh, my name is Josh Sher, and uh, I am a, a writer at Naughty Dog. I have been there for about uh, 17 years now, and I have worn many hats. Uh, most recently, I was the uh, co-writer on Uncharted The Lost Legacy, and that is our topic of discussion today. Uh, specifically, character development in non-linear spaces, uh, meaning that we created our first open world section for uh, The Lost Legacy, which is a large exploratory section in the Western Ghats re region of India. And uh, it required that we rethink our tried and true narrative techniques. Now, uh, one little caveat is that uh, I did the outline for this talk and I realized I had about 70 minutes worth of material and this is a 30 minute talk. So I turned this into kind of a, a high level case study, uh, a look at our thought process or if you prefer our making it up as we go along process. Uh, but I'm just curious, how many of you have played an Uncharted game in here? Okay, cool. Uh, how many of you have played uh, Lost Legacy? Also cool, very cool. All right, well, just so everybody knows, uh, it's very difficult to talk about the story without giving away little bits and pieces. Uh, nothing on the order of uh, Darth Vader's Luke's father. Everybody knows that, right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so apologies in advance. Um, for those of you not familiar with the franchise, Uncharted is a modern day pulp action adventure starring one Nathan Drake, treasure hunter, thrill seeker, purveyor of fine quips. But after the fourth game, we had this opportunity to do a spin-off title. Uh, bigger still, a opportunity to uh, break away from Nathan Drake and apply the Uncharted template to some new protagonists. And we decided to go with Chloe Frazier. Um, she is a fan favorite from Uncharted 2, and uh, she's kind of a dark mirror version of Drake. Uh, she's also a skilled treasure hunter and thief, but uh, whereas Drake's got a hero's complex, uh, she's a lot more about self-preservation, uh, even at the expense of her friends and allies. Uh, so with that, we decided to form the basis of our story uh, around a moment where she had to make a conscious decision to risk her life for the sake of others for the greater good. Now, once we've established the foundation of her arc, uh, we next considered who her companion would be. See, we like having companion characters in our games. Apart from helping out in the fight, uh, they bring out different facets of our character that you might not see otherwise. And companions are also great for uh, building character through common conversations and shared moments. Uh, in fact, when you see an Uncharted protagonist on their own, it's usually because they screwed up big time. Um, so to recap, you know, we want someone who provides contrast and conflict, someone who draws out the uh, inner aspects of your main character and can be a catalyst for change. We considered many possibilities, but we kept circling back to Nadine Ross. She was our, one of our antagonists from Uncharted 4. Um, she is the only antagonist to actually survive an Uncharted game. Uh, you know, very small club. Uh, she's at a, a interest, kind of an interesting place in her life. Uh, at the end of Uncharted 4, she has lost control of Shoreline, her private military company. She's somebody who's used to commanding an army, uh, but now she's been reduced to asking uh, Chloe Frazier, this low-life treasure hunter, for help and a job. Uh, equally important, she also provided some interesting contrast for Chloe. Lots of good opportunities for growth and conflict for the both of them. And their similarities and differences, along with uh, Chloe's arc from selfish to selfless, would form the basis for their relationship for the game. So we have our characters, and next we need a story. So here is a very brief rundown of the Naughty Dog process. Uh, with our games, the goal is to seamlessly combine story and gameplay. And as such, the story and design teams are in constant communication. Uh, the writers and directors develop the story outline and the beats. Uh, most days that was some combination of myself, uh, creative director and co-writer Shauna Skye, game director Kurt Marginau, and lead designer James Cooper. Now, while we're breaking down the story, uh, the designers are busy prototyping uh, gameplay mechanics and levels, uh, but the teams often meet to uh, share progress and make suggestions. And in the early days, the story can be adjusted to accommodate design and uh, vice versa. So we try to get as much of that done early as we can. And ultimately, we create what we call the story macro. It's kind of a roadmap for a story and design. It gets the whole team on the same page. Uh, we never write the entire script and hand it to the designers and say, here, go make this, because we want to keep things nice and fluid to allow for changes and improvements. Um, now, not to say that anything's set in stone, it's still a living document, and we continue to fill in these story details. Now, to uh, quickly summarize Lost Legacy for those who haven't played it, uh, treasure hunter Chloe Frazier has hired ex-mercenary Nadine Ross to help her explore India and to recover the priceless and fictional Tusk of Ganesh before Asav, a cunning insurgent commander, uses it for his own nefarious purposes, and we're off to the races. Now, 
we design our games around a paradigm that we call the active cinematic experience. Active being the key. Uh, we like to keep things on the stick because we feel that moments conveyed through gameplay have a bigger impact. And we aim to sell a single cohesive story, uh, no branching narratives. We do allow a lot of player agency within the confines of a level and the gameplay mechanics, but we cannot let them affect the, out time, at the outcome of the story. And we call this the uh, wide linear approach. But since we know where the character and the player are going to be at all times, we can plot the character relationship and write accordingly, and we can tailor the visuals and narrative for the maximum impact. And that's kind of why we've avoided open world design. Uh, pacing is paramount in our games, and with open world, the player sets the pace. And if the player doesn't feel the same urgency that your characters do, it kind of throws things off. And also, quite frankly, we want you to actually see all that beautiful and expensive content that we've produced. So, um, the thing is, that approach hasn't always jived with the exploratory spirit of the Uncharted series. Uh, so in for Uncharted 4, we decided to dip our toe in the water a little bit. So there was the Madagascar level, which was massive with some wide exploratory loops, but ultimately we funneled you along this linear path. And then there was also the um, At Sea chapter. You know, massive, lots of places to wander, but we signposted you to a trigger point that unlocked a linear path through the level. Now, our takeaway from this is that even though these levels weren't open per se, uh, the pacing of these levels had to allow for the player taking their time. It couldn't be too urgent or dire. The whole, uh, don't worry, I'll save you, ooh, what's that shiny thing over there, problem. It's kind of hard to keep the player immersed when they're distracted. But we knew that the Lost Legacy might be the last Uncharted game, so we kind of decided to go for it and create a true open space. Uh, our chapter set in the Western Ghats region of India. And we soon discovered that creating a narrative in an open space required that we rethink our usual working methods. And the Western Ghats was the largest explorable space that we've ever made. So in this level, Chloe and Nadine climb a tower, conveniently placed as a vantage point. They find three ancient Hoysala Empire fortresses, each a mini level into itself. And inside, you climb cliffs, you solve puzzles, and you fight dudes. And once inside, you also find and activate these old valves to open the secret gate to the city of Halabidu. And if you feel so inclined, you also find 11 optional doodads scattered in various places and bring them back to a shrine overrun with monkeys. So with all the different places that you can visit and in any order, it all kind of adds up to a lot of different ways to play through the level. Impossible to account for all of them, let alone write for all of them. So given that, how do we give the player freedom to choose their path while one, developing Chloe and Nadine's relationship in a consistent way, and two, not completely blowing our budget and our time constraints? So we started doing what we do with every level, which is to determine which moments need to occur and what info needs to be conveyed to the player. So we created this ever-evolving list, which gradually got narrowed down to, yes, narrowed down to this. Uh, that's kind of a lot. <laughs> And you certainly don't want to do it all in the cutscenes. Now, it's important to remember also that this is just one chapter in the game. A big one, but still, we're not going from Rrr to high five, more like professional to tentatively friendly. So all the dialogue had to be calibrated accordingly. So next, we needed to, do, uh, to determine where we were going to be doling all that information out. So we started by considering the player's main goals for the level, meaning the actions required in order to progress any story progression needed to be tied to one of those key elements. Now, moving along to the next phase of Chloe and Nadine. Can I just say Chloe now? OK. Moving on to the next phase of Chloe Dean's relationship was thus tied to players activating one of the three valves and thus completing one of the three forts. For everything else in the level, whether it was the monkey shrine, the tower, the collectible tokens, we couldn't tie the key character moments to those because there was no guarantee the player would ever see it. For the same reason, nothing outside those key events could be vital to the player's understanding of the story. And what's more, we realized that all the dialogue in the level had to be written with a neutral tone as a baseline. Not too friendly, not too cold, because otherwise, depending on where you heard it, it could feel out of order. But more on that in a little bit. So having determined where we would advance the story and the characters, the next step was determining how. So which of our narrative tools do we use to deliver which story beats? We use several tools for developing our characters all along the spectrum of uh, interactivity and player agency. So at the top, in the non-active cinematic experience zone, we have 
cutscenes. And at the bottom, the dialogue that plays during moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. <clears throat> Each of these tools have their strengths and weaknesses when it comes to telling an interactive story. So I'm going to break it all down like an ancient city. First, we usually use the tools, and then we First, I'm going to tell you how we use the tools, and then I'm going to tell you how we adapted them to work in the Western Gods chapter, starting with the cutscenes. This is obviously the least interactive way to tell a story in a game, uh, but it grants you a captive audience. So we usually start writing these before anything else, because they're independent enough from the gameplay that they can be written even before levels are in block mesh form. And it helps us explore and define our characters. And because they're not interactive, we try to only employ them when absolutely necessary and to space them out as widely as possible. We save them for the key moments where the character beats where we really want to see the emotion on the character's faces, or we don't want the player to potentially interrupt it. I won't say it's impossible, but it's very difficult to get any of these emotions any other way. And there, now you don't have to play the game. <laughs> Please play the game. <laughs> okay. For the Western Gods chapter, we felt that these were the beats best suited for the cutscenes, as they brought the characters closer and they moved Chloe along from her arc from selfish to selfless. Also helping tie Chloe to her Indian heritage and helping set up Nadine's chance for redemption. Also setting up Sam Drake's appearance later in the game for the benefit of people who didn't play Uncharted 4. So these cutscenes played after Claudine activated a valve at each of the three forts. It advanced uh, their relationship in a nice, simple, linear progression that we could control for maximum narrative impact. Easy, right? Not so much. Why? Because it's an open world game. And the player could visit the forts in any order. If the scenes played out of order, that'd be kind of a disaster. And uh, shooting the same cutscene to work in three different locations would be prohibitively expensive. So the solution was that we made the footprint of the three valve areas exactly the same. So instead of shooting three different scenes per fort, we just shot three scenes. And they all played out exactly the same way in each location. That way, we can have the three scenes play in the correct order and allow Claudine's relationship to progress, regardless of the order that you tackle the forts. And it's not going to let me skip. What's it? OK. Next up, scripted sequences. Uh, in some ways, these are kind of interactive cutscenes uh, in that we sometimes control the camera or we limit the player's moveset somehow so that we can control the moment. But, but the player is still in control. It's all interactive. Uh, our big action set places fall into this category, uh, though sometimes they are also used for more intimate moments, such as the elephant ride. This is our uh, active cinematic experience. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, emotional Impact, things will have a lot more impact if you have it on the stick, in control. And more often than not, we use them as a climax to a story beat. Now, the thing is, we didn't actually really have any of these in the Western Gats chapter, because in our open world scenario, there's no controlling the pace or the order of the approach, and we didn't want players to hit the high point too early. So we saved them for later. Uh, next up, one of the key components of this chapter, uh, driving dialogue. Given the uh, scope of the level, we didn't want to force players to uh, hoof it all over the place. And you know, what better time to engage in some casual banter than on a cool road trip to the Western Ghats? So due to the degree, due to the, due to the degree of interactivity, uh, driving dialogue has some caveats. Uh, first of all, there's no fixed camera, so you can't get up close and personal. The player could be hitting obstacles, going off drops, et cetera, et cetera. But the biggest thing was that these conversations can be interrupted by the player at any time, when they get out of the car, or entering an area of interest, or a combat zone. Now, we developed an interrupt system for Uncharted 4, which we carried over here, and that enabled us to allow the player to exit the Jeep at any time and have the conversations resume naturally, but still player-controlled interruptions. On top of all that, all the dialogue has to be semi-projected over the sound of the engine, so it's probably not the best place for needing to ask, Chloe, why do you resent your father so much? So. <laughs> However, it was still incredibly useful for progressing uh, Claudine's relationship. Even though all the driving took place out in the open world, we didn't have to write the dialogue in a neutral tone because we could progress the connection between the characters. We could break up the conversations into phases, just like we did for the cutscenes. The first conversation would play at the start of the level. The second conversation would play after you got back into the Jeep when finishing the first fort, and so on and so on. So we were able to utilize topics and moments that would have made the cutscenes drag, but sound perfectly natural while driving around. 
Now, before writing these conversations, we did have to determine how long the player would be in the Jeep and then write the conversations to fit in that time. And since they knew the level better than anyone, I asked our QA team to find the shortest time between key landmarks. And it turns out the answer was 15 to 20 seconds. Now, obviously most players will take longer, but it served as a good guide for how many seconds the players would definitely hear. Because once the player entered the next fort, the current conversation would not be resumed later. One, because it would be too long a separation, it could be as long as like 20 minutes. And two, all the conversations would just end up bunching up at the end. So when writing, I broke the long conversations into three chunks, each about 15 to 20 seconds long. So the first chunk was a bit vital to Clodine's character arcs. You know, here we have Nadine assessing her current status and Chloe throwing in a bit of her personal philosophy. And you would definitely hear this bit before getting to the next fort. The second chunk built on the first with a bit of Chloe backstory and some Nadine philosophy. You would probably hear this, but if you didn't, it wasn't the end of the world. And then the last chunk, after a pause from the previous ones, would usually reserve for banter a chance to see the characters talk about things in the outside world. Fun, but not essential, and if you missed it, no big deal. Now, while this was tricky to plan out, it was still relatively easy to uh, control the tone and progression of Clodian's relationship, because we knew when the player would be hearing each conversation. However, this was not the case for level dialogue. Now, this is the stuff that's spoken by the characters while exploring the level, 100% interactive. So to account for all the branching and for all the character progression possibilities, we wrote and recorded nearly three times as much dialogue for this level than we did for the largest level in Uncharted 4. Yow. On a base level, uh, level dialogue is useful for several things, giving little nudges and hints, uh, supplementing environmental storytelling, and filling in the historical backstory that would have bloated the length of the cutscenes. So here's an example from that. Hey, look, our moments. You were right, Nadine. I have my moments. It's all Persian. Uh, looks to be a mix of Persian and Hoysala. First line of defense. So, nice and simple, but sort of helps build things along. But level dialogue is equally important for creating a large number of little tiny character moments. These little moments can really add up to a lot. And this is where you can get the subtlety in. Not that the dialogue has to be subtle, and frankly, it often isn't. But over time, you build that slow, gradual relationship. And like I said earlier, when you can get these moments in the gameplay on the stick, they have a lot more impact on the player. So here's an example of what we can do through a uh, classic uh, Uncharted uh, valving mechanic, pull-ups. Yeah, give me your hand. No matter what the player does, Chloe will not take Nadine's hand in this clip. I'm good, actually. Okay. Yeah, I've got you. All yeah. right, I can manage. Just accept my help. Here, though, she doesn't have a choice. Come on up. But only because you said please. I didn't actually. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so that last clip was cheating a little bit because uh, it was part of a small mini cutscene. However, I wanted to point out that up until this point in the game, uh, that point in the game, Nadine calls Chloe by her last name, Frazier. This is the first time that she ever calls her Chloe. And this is something else that we build up to over the course of the game, using that same mechanic that's very familiar. Now, we also use level dialogue to uh, give characters more character. Uh, it took us a while to uh, calibrate Nadine's personality. At first, we made her way too harsh in our early drafts. And I really wanted to give her something that you wouldn't necessarily expect from a, a hardened mercenary. And one night I was thinking of these old animal fact cards that they used to advertise on TV when I was a kid. And yeah, one dollar, <laughs> one dollar. And I thought, what if Nadine grew up with a set of these? And the answer is this. Well, why? They're just large flying rodents. Actually, no, they're not. Yeah, they are. They're closer to primates than leaders. Okay, well, I'll look it up. Fraser, over here, look. What, what is it? Monkeys. You seem excited. I like monkeys. <laughs> That's Vasuki, a king of the Nagas, entities that take the form of the king cobra. It shows his control over fear and death. Mm. Cobras were always my favorite snake. Don't think I have a favorite snake. So there are many more examples, but this is kind of a way to uh, sneak in some little uh, quirks into Nadine's character without necessarily cluttering up the cutscenes with it. Now, another tool sort of related to level dialogue in our arsenal. Um, if there's something that we want to convey and the gameplay space is just a little too tight to fit it, we will sometimes drop in a optional dialogue prompt. 
Now, if the player chooses to engage, the pl dialogue plays out and we put the player into a forced walk and they can't climb or otherwise interact. Uh, it's not ideal, but sometimes it's necessary. Now, you can't guarantee that the player is going to hear the dialogue, but you know most people have this Pavlovian reaction to seeing a button prompt. <laughs> so sometimes we put in a little exposition, sometimes a little character moment, and sometimes a little bit of both. Wow, nice shot. Persians must have had a trebuchet. Trebuchet? Can't you just say catapult like a normal person? A trebuchet is a type of catapult. It can handle heavier projectiles, like this one, and fling them longer distances. Right. You learned that in your military training? I looked it up on Wikipedia, like a normal person. Hey, where's Sam? Don't think he has a rope. Oh, right. Forgot about that. He can sort it out. Hey, thanks for not murdering Sam, by the way. We might prove useful later. There you go. Good. Positive attitude. Good act as a decoy. Draw some fire away from us. Throw himself on a grenade and save us all. Come on. We're exposed up here. You know, I feel so much safer with her around. I never would have found you without her help, okay? Okay. She just wants to kill me, so... Well, don't give her a reason to. So... So all that stuff, all those different techniques for level dialogue, worth beautifully in, uh, I need a little more time because we started late. All this stuff works beautifully in linear design. And the way that we designed our cutscenes and our driving dialogue, we still had control over those. But the dialogue and the forts themselves are anywhere else in the world? No. Since the player could explore the fort interiors and other places in any order, what we wrote couldn't have a linear progression. It could wreck the flow if you hit it at the wrong time. So again, we wrote the dialogue with a neutral tone to reflect that. But we could build on the neutral dialogue to better reflect the current state of Claudine's relationship. Depending on where you were and how many forts you completed, we could add to or replace the neutral dialogue with something more friendly. There are literally hundreds of places we did this in the level. So here's an example of how we build on neutral dialogue. The neutral version, the one that plays if this is the first fort you found, come first, then we build on it a little of the second, and then more for the third. You'll see a little fort icon in the lower left. <laughs> Oh, oh. Well, you made it across at least. See another way over here? Sit tight. Or stand. Stand tight. Copy that. Oh, shit. Oh. Well, you made it across at least. Sorry. I'm sure you can find your way over here. Oh, definitely. Figured you'd want to take the easy way over. Across at least. Sorry. I'm sure you can find your way over here. Oh, definitely. Figured you'd want to take the easy way over. Oh, please. Show me how it's done. Watch and learn. <laughs> so through this, we can build up the relationship depending on how far you progress when you make it to that point. Now, here's another example after successfully taking out some insurgents via stealth. That's it. The site's clear. Not bad, Fraser. I'll take a not bad from you. That's it. The site's clear. Not bad, Fraser. There's hope for you yet. Thank you. That was intense. And one more. Hey, look who's here. Grey Langdon. Huh? The Grey Langdon office. Thanks, Jane Goodall. Hey, look who's here. Grey Langdon. Huh? The Grey Langdon office. You're adorable. Shut up. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the last example of that and continue. Now, you may have thought, uh, but Josh, you left environmental storytelling off that list of narrative tools. And you're right. We don't have too much time to cover it, but it's in there, obviously, all over the place. But it's a little bit different and uncharted than something like, say, The Last of Us. Uh, with The Last of Us, it's uh, set among, uh, oops, sorry, there we go. With The Last of Us, it's set among rec recognizable places and objects from our modern lives. And it's much easier to play or to sort of like take it all in and interpret without comment. But with Uncharted, places are much more ancient, so we depend on our characters to comment on it to understand the understanding of the story. We do that through other techniques, especially level dialogue, as you saw a little bit earlier. So to recap, when writing for our open world level, we approached it the same way we would any other level, then adjusted our tools, level dialogue in particular, to allow for player choice. Now, 
I know this has been kind of an orderly, some might say linear way to explain it, but in actuality, production isn't linear. We didn't figure all that stuff out in order. Our process looks a little bit more like this. And that's okay, because we start with a strong story outline, and then through the organic process of collaborating with the design, we flesh out the details and the implementation. We try things out, we take chances, and sometimes you have setbacks. And then you rally and come up with better ideas and get back on track. In a way, we were kind of doing open world design, just in our design process, and not in the game itself up until now. But our open design process comes with a cost. We originally scheduled for a game with four hours of content. And what we shipped, for various and sundry reasons, ended up being about double that. Uh, and this obviously <laughs> threw things into disarray. So for starters, this list evolved and changed a lot, particularly which bits ended up we included in the cutscenes. And this is no different than our usual process, but in an open world section where had this many moving parts, it led to a lot of hurry up and wait when it came to the recording and the implementation. And on that subject, we also found ourselves in a situation with no really good options. Our short schedule meant that we'd only have time for one series of sessions in the recording booth with very little time for pickups. And we didn't have time to do tests in game beforehand to properly assess what bits we actually needed. So to cover our asses, we wrote way more than we ended up using, because if something didn't get in on that first pass, it might not get in the game at all. And this, of course, made a tight recording schedule even tighter. Whoops. So if a conversation ended up not fitting into an intended space, we either trim it or we cut it entirely. And last, we didn't use any special software to uh, track all these variations. Uh, lots of that information was either in the script or in my head, meaning that you had to know where to look in the script or know where I was hiding, usually under my desk. So, lessons learned. This whole open world business is really freaking difficult, and obviously Naughty Dog's a little bit late to that party, but uh, we have newfound appreciation for teams who uh, execute open world games and games with uh, branching narratives. Uh, but should we ever do anything like this again, we do have some takeaway lessons from the experience. We'll know to tie our character progression to the key goals because that grants us a greater degree of narrative control. We'll plan to put key character beats in the areas that the player is guaranteed to see. And if you can't tie progression into the specific events in a known order, we need to build on it and track it with a level dialogue. And then we'll leverage what we learned swapping lines in for the neutral dialogue to create a continuous flow for the character development. And to avoid the whole recording cluster fudge, uh, one thing that we're already doing on The Last of Us 2 is writing temp dialogue for the levels way earlier than we ever have before. So even though things are gonna likely shift or change, we have a better sense of what we need in advance of recording. The hope being is that next time it'll feel a little bit more like this and a little bit less like this. <laughs> Our goal with the Western Gods chapter was to make this open world environment while maintaining a consistent logical progression to Clodine's relationship, no matter how the player approached the level. And to do all this without making it a mad dash to the finish. We got it half right. We have to do it better next time. Um, to state the obvious, writing is just one aspect of the writing, of making the characters. We couldn't have done it with all of, out of our character designers and sculptors, but a special shout out goes to our audio team and the audio scripters in particular. There were a lot of branches and such to track and a lot of dialogue to implement, and it never would have come together without their efforts. And obviously, you know, much thanks to uh, Claudia Black and Laura Bailey's awesome performances, none of it would have mattered because they bonded early and they knocked it out of the park. My one regret with them is that they were often doing uh, Valley Girl versions of their line reads in the recording booth. And if we had had time, we totally would have made it an unlockable language option. But <laughs> maybe next time. So, like I said, I couldn't cover everything, so if you're interested in more of our process, I'll be doing the breakout session after this, or you can ping me on Twitter, but also, Neil Druckmann and Bruce Straley a while back gave a talk about Uncharted 2. Uh, it's eight years old, but follows a lot of the same principles. Ryan James, our editor on Lost Legacy, gave a good talk, and they're both on YouTube for free. And that's all I got. Thank you for coming.